Sixt Fetzler is an expert in uh, study of religion and an expert in martial arts in every way that you want to conceive of that, practitioner, theorist, <laughs> historian, scholar, and we are talking now at the end of the 2020 uh, Martial Arts Studies Conference, which was originally meant to be in Marseille, but has gone online. So Dr. Wetzler, how are you? Hello, Paul. I'm fine. I'm very fine. Hope you're Good. fine too. So uh, in you... your, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I want to talk about religion and martial arts now. So um, <laughs> in, <laughs> in your presentation, you talk about um, a wide number of concepts of religion that, um, you know, whenever mm. anyone says, says religion, there are so many different concepts of it and so many different definitions of it. How many uh, and what kinds of concepts of martial arts are you seeing structuring the discourse of martial arts studies today as it evidenced by this conference? Mm. The, you mean uh, religions? How many concepts of, of religions? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I guess there's there's um, two main main strands, two two main um, ideas about religion um, that are also already structuring the title of the conference. Yeah? Because um, whoever made up the title, I don't know if it was you or <laughs> the, your colleagues in, in in France or whoever coined that. Um, didn't decide to call to call the conference martial arts and religion yeah? mm. or martial arts and spirituality but martial arts and religion and spirituality yeah? and i think this this binary of of uh, religion and spirituality mm -hmm. this is an idea that is in the background obviously of the of the minds of the people who are who are thinking about this um, and maybe this is on the one hand or this is a um, a binary of a more psychological reaction of the human mind to something transcendent, whatever that might be. Okay. And the other thing is the more organized, um, the more social um, fact that we as a society, we, we create a system out of religion. We give it names. Um, at the very keynote, uh, Doug Farah addressed that I guess when he when he said um, that that uh, spiritual experience get petrified into religion or something. I, I hope I do not misquote him. I think it, yeah, it's um, spiritual experience is turned to stone in organized religion. Yeah, he also that. says that martiality is ossified and turned to stone and become martial arts. So yeah, he, he says that a few times. Things things become hardened and they become identified as yeah. something. So anyway, yeah. continue. Exactly. So I think that this is this is the the two main lines um, which define many of the of the um, presentations that we had online now. Um, thanks to everyone who who took part. It's beautiful. Such a such a um, kaleidoscope of of different different perspectives. Um, and for the first time, you do not miss anything because you can you can watch it all <laughs> afterwards on YouTube. It's really nice. So I think that these these two ideas um, shape many of um, the presentations, so that it's either about the, the social, the fixed construct of religion as, a, as an entity in society, and the other is the more, the more personal relationship um, to it. Yeah. And of course, uh, both have a, both have a um, theoretical background, both also have a history in the study of religion. Yeah. The one is the more sociological approach. You have the, the French school, uh, Durkheim and, and Marcel Moss, these people who say that, that religion is a, um, a social factor that organizes social life. Um, and the other would be very strongly prevalent in the uh, religionsphenomenologie, the phenomenology of, of religion, um, which is, is in, in great critique nowadays, because there were people, uh, for example, like I think it was Udo, Rudolf Otto who said, um, well, if you never had a, um, a, a feeling for the holy or a religious feeling, you should stop reading my book now and you cannot do science or history of religion anyway. Yeah? So to them, it's more about the, the personal, um, personal exchange with the, the, the transcendent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think, I, think I, I, I get that. I mean, with, with, with Doug Farah's opening, opening keynote, I think that he does something with martiality, which I guess sounds a bit like spirituality, doesn't it? So if, if mm. in his thinking, the things that we call martial arts are kind of institutions that have, that have 
kind of clotted together and formed mm. uh, and 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 um, stabilized the flow of, of energies in, cer in certain ways. Um, so I guess that that martiality would be similar to spirituality in that it kind of flows and is always imminent and always potentially present and it has a long kind of lineage but martial arts are like religions they're equivalent to religions in this in this model like that they're, they're stabilized institutions yeah in this in this model exactly and um i think that this is already where the problems begin because uh, i for my my part at least I do not really believe in this model. This is also what I tried to point out at the very end of my presentation. When we talk about martial arts, we had this ongoing discussion for the last years now. What is martial arts? Can we define it? How can we define it? If we don't define it, how do we work with it? And the very same is true for religion, of course, and then for spirituality. Yeah? So I think that it is extremely difficult to really pinpoint what exactly is this, what we are talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and if we cannot define what we're talking about there, then it's also weird in a way to make, uh, to, to, to make these, these binary options then between religion and spirituality. Because I promise you, once you start to look at it, what people actually do, what people actually feel and how they describe their, their religious behavior or spiritual behavior, then you will see that this is not a clear cut model, that you cannot, that you cannot juxtapose um, spirituality on the one hand and this is the, there's also, of course, a notion of positive and negative. Uh, at least I read that, for example, into Doug, uh, Doug Farrow, what he said that it gets petrified. So there's a positive way, which is dynamic and spontaneous. Um, and there's a negative way to deal with that. And there's, this is the, the petrified boom, square religion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I, don't believe, I don't believe that this is necessarily uh, what you find in the in spiritual or religious lives of people, also of so, much as practitioners. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so you mentioned the title of the conference. Um, I didn't choose it. Um, I we did discuss it, but but the the other organisers, um, Professor De Grave and and Doug Farah, and and uh, say maybe Laurent Gabriel, um, they were very clear that these were the three coordinates that, mm -hmm. that they wanted. And I was thinking, well, that'd be cool. You know, it's always good to have a theme and to, and to work it out. But I resisted it because I, I wanted to pluralize spirituality. I wanted it to be spiritualities mm -hmm. um, because it seemed to me like religion is a thing. And we discussed whether we should pluralize religion to religions. And, but to me, spirituality seemed like a much more nebulous thing. Like I, I was worried about because I don't know what it is. I know what religion is because I know what it looks like because it has the institutions and it has mm. the, and it's, it's a concept that I'm familiar with and I was brought up with it and I went to church and I know, but spirituality and, and it makes, I don't know, mm. like what, what would be the concept of spirituality then that, mm. that either you see at play in the work here or that you would want to kind of advocate for? Mm. I mean, I've, I have my own non-religious studies kind of take on it, but I want to hear yours first. Mm. Um, my take on it, um, this is based on the, on the Tübingen School of, of History of Religion, where, where I was um, brought up um, in a way, um, would be the one that I presented also or in my presentation, um, the one by, by Thomas Luckmann, yeah, that this distinction um, is not not necessarily helpful, and that probably you shouldn't you shouldn't make it at all. Yeah, um, what you are saying now, you you were just repeating, in a way, um, what I said before. You said I was brought up, I was going to church, so I know what religion is, but what is spirituality? Mm -hmm. um, and I rather would wanted to use the term religion uh, as a as an as a huge umbrella term for all this field, because within this field, these phenomena are so distinct on one hand and also so overlapping and there are so many of them yeah, mm -hmm. that, that um, tearing apart this whole wide field now into a, two distinct entities, I think that wouldn't work because there are many, many more yeah? mm -hmm. and so many more that probably it's better to, to subsume them all as, as, yeah, as I said, one field that is worth looking at. And Thomas Luckmann, what he, what he said, um, with the um, shrinking transcendence, expanding religion, I think that he would he would classify much of what what probably many of the of the speakers of our conference 
would classify as spirituality, Lukman would say, yeah, well, this is the shrinking, shrinking transcendence, exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. Yeah. Mm. So instead of, instead of having a, um, fixed uh, overlying religious system it's more about my personal development my own feeling my m meeting with these transcendence um, um experiences mm. yeah. okay okay i mean you said that the last time we talked and you you said that the the kind of paradigm that was used in your religious studies uh education and training um was really that you would use a kind of ideological analysis, like a religion is, is assumed to be an ideology in the kind of, uh, like kind of Max Weber sense of, it's a material practice that produces beliefs and, 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 and actions and types of subjectivity. So it's almost like pre sort of Althusser, sort of like, it, it's, just a, it's, it's just ideology. I mean, um, that, we, that we may or may not distinguish yeah. from other forms of ideology. Yeah. Yeah. Is it equivalent to any belief system? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that this is, this is um, true. What, what, true. This is the way that I would think about it, <laughs> which doesn't mean that, it's, uh, that it has to be true, but it's, this is my, my perspective. And um, yes, the, the problem is that our, the word already, the word religion, uh, comes from, of, of course from a European background and was coined within a European religious tradition. So superimposing it uh, on other cultures is already where it starts to fail and it must fail. Yeah? This is something that when, when we're talking about now about the re religion or the spiritual side of martial arts, when people think of martial arts as something far Eastern very often and then something Buddhist, something Zen Buddhist even. So um, Sometimes when, when people who are practicing Buddhism in Germany, at least, I know some people, when you, when you will tell them, oh, you're, you're Zen Buddhist religion. No, no, this is not a religion. This is a philosophy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is, is Buddhism, is Zen Buddhism, is it a philosophy or a religion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is probably a little bit like asking whether an octagon uh, is a square or a circle. Well, it's kind of both, but it's not. Yeah? So we're using a, a term that comes from a European tradition to describe phenomena, social phenomena, ideolo ideological phenomena all mm. over the world. Yeah? And I think that this will be extremely difficult mm. if, we, if we want to use it in an essentialist way. Yeah? If we want to define, okay, religion is this, and therefore we know that these Japanese guys, they also have religion because they believe this or that. Mm. Yeah? Mm, that doesn't work, I think. I think we can only, we can only talk about um, how people organize their, how people organize the, uh, their ideas about the world. Uh, mm -hmm. This is more or less, and w when I say world now, I don't mean only the physical world, but yeah. the whole, yeah. the, the cosmos. Yeah. Yeah. When, when we were discussing the, the, the concepts that we would use to structure the, the, the conference theme, I, want, I wanted words like faith and belief mm. um but they kind of got shouted down a little bit very politely and very quietly mm. but they were, they were shouting nonetheless um because I, I wanted to go for a much more secular approach to to the sense of when you're a martial arts practitioner you totally start to believe in it right i mean mm. this is this is the origin of so many you know, you, you, you do your style and you believe it and you believe your instructor and you believe the legends mm. and you, you believe mm. the anecdotes, right? Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, unless it's MMA and you've got the visual evidence okay. of, of, of who won and who lost, but like you believe the stories about victory. And that makes you then look at the other martial arts styles and go, ha, they think, yeah, but exactly. we've got stories about when we beat them. Yeah. So like that, that's a, almost a religious kind of yeah. a structure, isn't it? It's a structure yeah. of faith and belief and you have this sincere, and, and therefore the training becomes an act of devotion and you f it becomes ritualistic and there's all these other concepts. I mean, what would you, would you have liked to see those concepts more explicitly foregrounded in the conference or? Um, yes, I think that this, this is um, super interesting and is something worth talking about, worth discussing. And I haven't, I couldn't claim that I have seen all the presentations that are online by now. I will see them in the weeks to come. Um, so maybe there were people who were addressing these, these topics. Yeah. Um, 
but anyway, I think that these these are extremely extremely interesting. How do re, how do how do martial artists reassure that what they do is true or correct? Yeah, mm-hmm. and this is again this this topic of mythization uh, of your own practice. You need to have these obviously. You need to have these stories that guarantee you your practice is correct, either because we're doing it like the snake did it when it fought against uh, this or that other animal, or um, also because we have to do it like this, because the founder of our style, when he was fighting against these 50 Manchu soldiers, he used this or that technique. Yeah. And you can, you can uh, see that again and again in, in various forms. I was today, um, a couple of hours ago, I was, I was having a discussion with, with Eric Burkhardt uh, on how, for example, um, academic study of medieval sources can be used to reassure modern HEMA practitioners that what they do is true. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So this seems to be a thing that comes again and again. And as you correctly said, I think where you do not see it or where it's not very prevalent is in, in competitive combat sports. Yeah? Mm-hmm. In, in boxing, usually you don't have a, have a story. Yeah? We, do, we do the jab like this because when the lion was fighting the tiger, he did like, you don't have it because either you punch the guy or you don't. Yeah? So it's, <laughs> you, can, yeah, you, can, you, can, you can test the, the truthfulness of your style immediately because you, um, what, you, what you're aiming for can be done in training as well. Yeah? You know what you're training for. And this is, of course, different um, when, you, when you start to talk about, yeah, we're doing self-defense or we're doing a combat system for the reality or something. Mm. yeah it's um i mean there's so many dimensions to that that i want to pursue like so i i, I wanted I, i'm in, i was more interested in in the idea of faith and belief because i think i guess a bit like the way that doug farrah wants to look for tr- traces and um sediments of martiality in so many forms of practice and he wants to to see that deep history and that 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 deep presence or to, to shine a light that sees the potential presence mm-hmm. of martiality. Um, you know, in much the way that, I mean, I don't know if you know much about English Morris dancing, right? But English a Morris dancing, well, bit. I think that, that's the thing, everyone knows a little bit. It's like a joke, right? Morris yeah. dancing, it's like, it, it's like, you know, we get these like middle to old age men yeah. who dr- love to drink real ale and craft beer. And <laughs> every so often they get, but like, it's obviously, from some kind of martial tradition, like mm. it's obviously somehow, or, or at least affecting that state, yeah. it at least has the, the the sense that it relates to a martial tradition that is missing. It could be a complete uh, simulation of such things. But I guess that Doug Farrer is asking us to um, to see the way that you could look at all of these different things, not just the exotic East Asian things where they mm-hmm. go, oh, yes, in the Philippines, mm-hmm. this dance is actually a really ferocious wrist lock and yeah. you know, this, da, da, da. But, but I guess, so martiality for, for, for Farah becomes a kind of scene that we could expose almost everywhere if we wanted to, it raises the question of confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, but I guess faith and belief is literally everywhere. It's like an economy of faith and belief that sustains practice, mm-hmm. isn't it? I mean. Yeah. It, this is at, like at work as well. Like you can buy into the ideology of your workplace. Like I'm going to work for this bank because they're really cool and da da da. But then when you, you lose faith, you just it's an absolute existential mm. crisis, right? Mm. You lose faith in your martial arts system. It's a complete it's, identity crisis. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. everywhere. It's not just it's not just a matter of faith or religion. It's it's everywhere. Yeah. This is also what I what I would uh, like to ask you when you say about faith and belief. Do you say that it's different? In martial arts, then I don't know from badminton or <laughs> deep sea fishing or something. So, so is there is there a, a special quality in martial arts? Do you need to have more faith and more belief when you go to a, when you go to a martial arts gym than when you, when you go to a, to a football club? Well, I, I guess there may be different quality. I do think that there are very there are specific differences between the practices, and I think it's quite good for me to have uh, experienced lots of different martial arts um, styles, because it's really, it's only within Tai Chi practice that I would say I'd ever had anything close to a spiritual mm. um, experience. And I think there's something about the structure of it, the discourse around it, and the things that you're being asked to look for. So like Doug Farah's telling us all to look for martiality in, in everything, right? In theater and in history and mm. on, paintings on cave walls and you go okay 
but in when you taught Tai Chi, you have to look for sensations mm. and you have to, which I think leads you to a sense that you could feel like you're having these profound kind of um, physical experiences. But other, other types of, ex I think it's to do with the pedagogical structure around it and what you're being trained to become sensitive to and, and, and alert to. I mean, um, ha have I had a mis... When I, was, when I was young and I was starting practices like Qigong, you know, the standing meditation, which actually encourages you to look for these mm. sensations and, and these states of perception and so on, or, or imaginary kind of mm. plenitude, or whichever language you want to use, um, it encourages that. So it encourages a sense of, of, of spirituality. But like, and my instructor said to me a long time ago, he said, he said he finds that the people who buy into the chi and the, the meridians and the life force and the cosmology, they go much further into the practice of qigong. Mm. And I tried to believe it. And I was like, nah, I'll take the stretches. I'll go slow. I'll pay attention to my posture. But I'm sorry, I just, I'm not going there, man. I'm not, I have faith in the practice, but I'm not a believer. Mm. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. do you find that in other, is it, is it a, and so, so I'm saying, I'm making a distinction between Tai Chi, Qigong, that kind of nexus and other things, even Kung Fu, external styles, kickboxing. You don't have a religious experience in kickboxing, right? Mm. Unless they're making a Hollywood dramatization yeah, well, of your life. It depends, it depends on how hard people hit you on the head. So you might. <laughs> <laughs> but what, you about, might what about in your experience of a, a, a range of like say Filipino martial arts, does, is that bound in with, Mm. a discourse of spirituality or transcendence or, or stuff mm. <clears throat> it, de it depends i guess it depends on on whom you ask um and um there is there is a supernatural dimension to it and that is huge definitely that is huge but according to the to the scheme that i built in my presentation uh, or to this to this distinction uh, usually in filipino martial arts what you would see is that the that the religion or the, the magical um level um is the sub level? It's dependent from the martial arts. So there are these practices of the of the anting anting. Yeah, you have you have talismans, you have amulets, you have tattoos, you have protective shirts with spells on it. Um, so there's there's a huge supernatural um, dimension. But this is support. Uh, this is supposed to support you in combat. Yeah? So there's there's also black magic. There's movements that are supposed um, to. Um, guide the black magic that somebody would throw on you into the ground that you are not hit by it, stuff like that. Um, so this is the one part. Um, then there is a strong belief, um, I, I've seen it with um, Grandmaster Leo Gahe, there's a strong belief in, in spirits, also the spirits of the forefather. In a positive way, he said that, that when he teaches, his grandfather from whom he learned the style is still in the room. Yeah. And he sees him while doing it and he, he teaches through him so your your ancestors are there with you in a way and also in martial arts practices and then there's a what he would call philosophical dimension so we believe in life not in death stuff like this so how do you want to it's a way of positive thinking so to say yeah. but um it's not what people often ask me when i tell them yeah i'm doing filipino martial arts ah do you also have that that um that philosophy and that meditation yeah. Yeah. So, as I said in my presentation, the evident connection, people in the West, they often assume when you tell somebody I do martial arts, then they would assume there is something meditative, something Buddhist to it. Yeah? And then they usually, they are astounded when you tell them, yeah, but the Filipino martial arts, they come from a Christian background. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> For them, then the question is answered. Ah, so, so it's not a Shaolin monk thing. Yeah. So, ah, okay, so there is no... Yeah, this, this, but as I said, it's, I think it's, it's a pop cultural connection, of course. Yeah. yeah, we assume in the West, we assume so much that there's this connection between karate and the Shaolin and everything. Mm. Yeah, so you have, to, you have to do the Buddhist monk to be properly. Yeah, you know, you know where my backdrop comes from. It's from the, it's from, is it from the Kung Fu series? It's the very opening scene, yeah, the sun know, rises and he walks over there. <laughs> and I've actually put these pictures along to, to blur out the word, um, to, to blank it out, to block it out. I think that the media, um, has, I mean, still, if you look at, I, I get Netflix recommendations in my emails and it's all like another TV series that will never end about fighting mm. women, female monks who are protecting something. And it's just like the same sorts of structures that haven't, re the same 
thematic and narrative uh, and dramatic structures that haven't changed uh, forever, except that I think that, uh, well, I say forever, since the 70s, right? <laughs> forever. Um, in which in which you have people trained in the East and they live forever and they're Taoist immortals, but they're also human and blah, blah, blah. And it's just this kind of Orientalist structure remains. It, it's like yeah. Hollywood loves it. Netflix yeah. loves it. It, it, it. It's it's not going anywhere yeah. fast. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to trace that back um, in the Western mindset. And now I can only speak about how, how Westerners perceive Eastern martial arts. Um, I do not read Chinese, I do not read Japanese, so I don't know what it's like there. I can talk about our perception of the martial arts. You have, of course, the pop cultural thing. So you have the movies, you have the 36th Chamber of Shaolin. Well, mm -hmm. thank God we have it. But um, you, have, you have also, um, most of all, I think you have, you have uh, Organ Harry, the uh, Zen in the Art of Arch Archery. Um, uh, Zen in der Kunst des Bogenschießens. And this, I think, um, in, uh, influenced so strongly our perception of this connection between spiritual meditative practices, religious practices, and the martial arts. Yeah? So it's not only the pop culture, it's also the more or less academic world yeah? that that's started to believe in this connection, yeah, in this defining connection between Eastern martial arts and Eastern spiritual practices from the, from the 1940s on. Yeah. Um, and this, this was carried on then. Yeah. And as we know, um, it was Herigl's interpretation yeah, that it, he wrote down about his yeah. practices. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> more or less, he made it up. Yeah, he made it up. Um, but but still, this is this carried on uh, all the time. And of course, and this is now the interesting point, um, when martial arts now try to um, to promote themselves in the West, they would use that. Of course, yeah? if you if you look at the home pages of the of the huge German karate associations or Aikido associations, also, of course, they would say that this is a spiritual discipline and it makes you a better person, and especially it will make your kids better persons. Yeah. <laughs> this is always very important. Yeah. So bring us your kids and then they will become um, more peaceful and they behave better and they'll be friendly and they'll be happy with themselves, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, this is a perfect marketing tool. And I think this is one of the reasons why it's, why it's so, so strong in our perception because this is what martial arts will tell you mm -hmm. to sell themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in many ways you think that martial arts are kind of substitute religions and they have to you know that they're, they're selling people something that 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 they're missing right i mean or, the, or that they, f they feel like they're missing but i guess if, i mean we've talked for maybe half an hour or so now I, I guess we should think about um so it looked to me like doug farrah's project is, is a search for some kind of conceptual if not specificity or precision he, he wants to he wants to define things some concepts so he, he he identifies the notion of martiality uh, which is the, the trace of, of some kind of I, I, I hesitate to say essence but I wonder if he's essentializing something about martial arts I mean what do you think about the quest for conceptual precision here or clarity can we take our concepts from religious studies or ideology critique or you know what what's are, are we forever going to be so Doug Farah says where chasing a moving target all the time. Mm. I mean, is this just Derrida's difference and it's just mm. the problem that's the ontological problem of our relationship to the world? Or, or is there, can we refine our concepts? Can we develop the concepts in martial arts studies or the study of martiality? Um, mm. You know, wh where are we? Are we still the same place we were five years ago? Are we mm. still, what, what have you seen developing conceptually? Mm. Mm. I don't think that we are at the same place where five years ago or ten years ago. Um, I think a lot developed, uh, and this is this is the the networks, the exchanges that we build, and people are building on the ideas that the other ones brought forth. So I think something is something is moving definitely. I still think that Dakar is right when he says we're we're chasing a moving target. Yes, of course we're doing, but this is this is nothing that that makes martial arts studies distinct from religious studies or <laughs> any um, other humanities. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, I always compare it for myself. I compare it uh, with if you look at a, a at the night sky and there's a there's a star that is that is not very bright. Yeah, if you look at it directly, you cannot see it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to look 
right next to it, close to it, but not directly at it, then you will, you will see it. Uh, then it becomes evident that it is there. But once you try to fix it, ah, this is the star, then it disappears. And I think this is a little bit the same with, with our topics, with martial arts. Um, as soon as we start to, to fix it and say this and only this is martial arts, mm. um, it will disappear. Yeah. Mm. But if we don't do this, everybody knows what we are talking about. Yeah. And this is the, this is the, the weird thing. Yeah. None of the presentations that we had now in this, in this beautiful conference, none of the presentations uh, was about what I had before, badminton or fishing <laughs> also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a beautiful presentation from Martin Meyer was about hockey, but it was about fighting in hockey. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So there was a connection. If you say we're having a martial arts conference, people know what they can expect from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're chasing a moving target, but I think we are quite good at at least restraining it to a, to a smaller room. And then I think that one of the problems, or a problem that, that I see, but this is my perspective, is that we still haven't solved, uh, we still haven't solved the, the relationship between us being academics and almost all of us also being martial arts practitioners. Mm -hmm. yeah? And for example, I, I noted down a quote um, from Mr. Almeida um, in, his, in his presentation, The Energy Manifests Itself. He's talking about, about his, his fieldwork study of Taiji Zhuang. And he said that we should build, or he wants to build frameworks that allow us to understand the way that the movement happens, but also in a way that we can make it useful for the practitioner. Yeah? So for him, martial arts studies, if I understand him correctly, should also be uh, a method to improve practice or to inform practice. Yeah? And to me, this is not at all the case. Yeah? Mm -hmm. For me, martial arts studies is an, is an academic project and our, our goal should be to understand martial arts and to describe them within our academic system, our way of, of thinking. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And if, then something spills over yeah? and somebody would say, well, my Dai Chi Chuan practice got so much better because I read Paul Bowman's mythologies of martial arts. Yeah. That's fantastic. But this is not the reason why we're doing this, I think. The reason why we're doing this is because we want to build a, a knowledge base and a base of understanding within the academic framework of martial arts. Yeah? And this is something we haven't really solved. And I think that this discussion how is the relationship between martial arts practice and martial arts studies? This will come again and again and again. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we'll need to yeah, have I, a discussion on that. I mean, I, th I, th I think that, um, I think there's a lot to say here. I think that we've got, I think that Doug Farah's uh, intention is really, really good. It's like, let's shake up our concept and see and let's and, and this concept of martiality that he really likes and see what that enables us to see and enables us to think and he he sets it up at the very start of his his lecture by talking about the the, the term martial arts studies which he sees an improvement as an improvement on the term hoplology uh, but i think that that there's a there's a confusion there which is which is that like doug farah is is an anthropologist right so he works always within the fields of anthropology. What anthropology needs is a paradigm, like it needs a question, it needs a driving question and a theory. Uh, it need, every subject needs a rationale, like the, the overarching paradigm of cultural studies was always like culture is political, gender is political, race is political, class is political. What's the paradigm of, of the study of martial arts. So this is why I think martial arts studies isn't and should not be a discipline. It mm -hmm. isn't anthropology, it isn't history, it isn't media studies. Mm -hmm. It's the place where people from these disciplines come together and cross fertilize and expand their thinking, much the same as happens when you go to any kind of seminar anywhere. But it mustn't become a, a, a sort of single um, disciplinary field with, with, with very defined kind of um, mm -hmm. terms and concepts. Um, and I think that I think there are already clear relationships between the academic study of martial arts and the real world. So, for instance, the obvious one is myth busting. I mean, 
you know, the, 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 yeah. the decent historical research that we're seeing coming out, people like Ben Judkins, Peter Lodge, and all the other historians who are just destroying this, bang, bang, bang. Yeah. And it's a kind of, that should be helping practitioners. It's probably destroying the careers of some teachers, you know? So it's, it's, it's doing a service to the world, which is actually also a kind of violence. Like you fall in love with the martial arts for oriental reasons, orientalist reasons, yeah. and mythological reasons. And yeah. then you read a book about it. You read, you read Ben Judkins or something and boom, you go, what? Yim Wing Chun didn't even exist. Maybe oh! I think he's invented in literature or what? Yeah. What's going on, yeah. man? <laughs> and so yeah. I think that, and also in, there's lots of other connections, but I think that you're right. I mean, you're absolutely right. The, the first, the first, um, responsibility that we have as scholars is not to some sense of outside scholarship or outside of intellect, like the body as opposed to the mind, mm -hmm. but it's to our own ability to conceptualize and ask why we want to conceptualize and what our paradigm is and what our what our project is. And you know, it doesn't always have to be the practitioner as the fantasy object because mm -hmm. we're the fantasy object too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. I think that um, concerning the myth busting, um, I think that's. That's important that you can be both at the same time. Right? You can also bust your own myths in the one instance, and on the next day, you can also not probably not believe in them, but they will they will shape your movement. Yeah, they will shape your way of thinking about your body, about your practice, and so forth and so forth. Yeah, I call that for myself. This is my personal experience now. I call that um, productive schizophrenia yeah? <laughs> because. Um, I'm a, I'm a Christian myself, I'm, I believe I go to church and so forth, and, but I'm also a historian of religion. Yeah? So, of course, as a historian of religion, you would, you'd, you'd be able to, to, to dissect Christendom, well, this is Greek religion, and this comes from, mm -hmm. from uh, um, um, Egyptian religion originally, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? So, of course, you, you see the strands where this comes from. Yeah? Mm -hmm. When you are at the university, when you're doing history of religion, but when you are in church, on Easter, uh, it's different. It feels different. And the one thing is an intellectual thing. The other, other is an emotional. And both are real for me. And probably both can be real for me as a martial, art, martial artist then. Yeah? I know about the, the historical background of my style and how they probably came to be. Um, and that most likely they do not, were not developed by a monk watching a crane fight a snake. But still, when I do the practice, when I do my town or so, I believe myself to be the crane and will change my way of movement and also how I feel. Yeah? So yeah. these myths are not wrong, yeah? Yeah. but they, they are not supposed to be there as a, as a um, historical narrative yeah? to, to, to give us the truth. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that this would make it easier if we make this, if we were able to do this distinction, that would make it easier then also to separate mm -hmm. uh, and not necessarily have the, um, the urge to have martial arts studies spill over into our practice. I think they can be two separate things and they can, uh, we can also be both at the same time. And if they spill over, well, fine, but yeah. this is not what they have to do. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you on that. I, I think, and the other thing, like, so Doug Farah says, and when he said it, it I, and I actually watched this bit twice, I, th I thought this is, this is not true. I thought this is a really idiosyncratic, he has a really idiosyncratic reading of Deleuze and Guattari when he, he's written this about this before, about the becoming animal, right, in martial arts. And I've always thought, you don't, you don't become animal. But now you say that. So like, if I'm doing Charlie foot form and, and it's a crane movement and, and we're crane here, I do think crane or you think dragon or this is tiger or this mm. is leopard or, mm. and so, and it, but it really does help you to, mm. to get into the movement and it does. Okay. But so in that sense, the myth is a pedagogical device. It's an, it's an imaginative device. So you imagine, but it enables a different form of thinking about your body mm. and maybe inspires a different, way to move i guess so myths are pedagogical devices too we should if we bust them then maybe we're screwed maybe there's nothing left <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i think we should we should bust them and tell them well this is not how it was in reality yeah back 500 years ago but still keep the myth also tell it tell it to your students tell it to those who train with you and and um, ingrain it in your body yeah but don't believe it as as reality this is this is uh, different and maybe <laughs> This is also so Western in a way that we want to have one reality. 
Yeah. So either the martial arts myth must be true or our academic understanding must be true. It can, well, both is true on different levels. Mm. Maybe, I don't know. Okay. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think that, we, that this discussion is, is ongoing. So if you ask me, uh, are we at the same point like five years ago or 10 years? Definitely not. Yeah, there's so much has been going on and there's so many important ideas have been, have been uh, shoved back and forth. Mm. But this, on this level, I think we we are still a little bit, little bit on the same on the same spot like we were five years ago. Mm -hmm. This discussion about how much is our our um, scholarship informed by our actual martial arts practice, and how much is it done to on the other on the other way or backwards benefit our our martial arts practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and this needs to be discussed further. I think we need to. Oh. Be, I think we should discuss it. Um, I mean, I, I'm looking at the clock. I'm aware of the time. And I'm also aware that now would be an ideal time at the end of the 2020 conference to announce the theme of the 2021 conference. So the 2021 conference will be held at the very end of June and very beginning of, uh, of July in Geneva will be yes. all, uh, organized by a team headed by people like Daniel Jacquet, our, our own favorite HEMA yes. expert. And the theme will be martial arts, I may have this the right way around or the wrong way around, martial arts, tradition and globalization or globalization and tradition. The yes. point is it's three, similar to this year, three <laughs> coordinates, martial arts, globalization and tradition. And these are, this will be the place that we will um, take these conversations forward so check out the websites for information about that but for now i want to um thank the conference organizers the people who really pushed this through to an online conference Absolutely. was laurent chocopre and gabriel facal because the other conference organizers we kind of went oh oh well we can't do this then <laughs> because of the pandemic and they said no we can do yeah. it and they have done it and and i think they've done a wonderful job yeah. um, and it's enabled me to at least speak to you if not uh, hang out with you for a few nights over a few beers, but it's been lovely talking to you six absolutely lovely Thank you, Paul. Thanks to the organizers also from my side and uh, see you next year. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you